Three hearts, blue blood, able to squeeze through a space the size of their eyeballs, intelligent enough to use tools or transform their bodies to mimic other animals, even communicate with different species. The secrets of the octopus are more extraordinary than we ever imagined. In the past few decades, what was once one of the most ancient and obscure animals on our planet has been at the center of a scientific and PR revolution, shape-shifting in the eyes of many, from enigmatic alien sea monsters to charismatic creatures worthy of study, protection, even love and admiration. Octopus are having their moment. A new book, Secrets of the Octopus, and its accompanying upcoming special on National Geographic, narrated by Paul Rudd, are diving deeper than ever before into the spectacular world of these cephalopods, sharing with us all the remarkable discoveries that have affirmed the octopus as one of nature's most intelligent and complex animals. Cy Montgomery, the author of The Soul of an Octopus and Secrets of the Octopus. Her work has taken her from the cloud forests of Papua New Guinea to the Altai Mountains of the Gobi. For The Soul of an Octopus, a National Book Award finalist, she befriended octopuses at the New England Aquarium and scuba dived and snorkeled with wild octopuses in Mexico and French Polynesia, earning her the moniker of the Octopus Whisperer. With Secrets of the Octopus, Sai now returns to the creatures that she adores, bringing current and compassionate stories about the scientists leading octopus research and conservation. I'm Warren Carlisle. I'm the founder of Octonation, the largest octopus fan club. Warren founder and CEO of Octonation, the world's largest octopus fan club and nonprofit organization with over a million followers, has been pivotal in increasing public awareness and fascination with these creatures. Their combined knowledge and passion make them an excellent duo for shedding light on the secrets of the octopuses. With an engaging narrative and breathtaking visuals, Secrets of the Octopus not only uncovers the enigmatic nature of these marine creatures, but also highlights the urgent need for ocean conservation. I'm Devin Boker, and you're listening to The Wildlife. I've, I've read a few different excerpts of the book so far, which I'm ecstatic about. Uh, I also see that there's the upcoming special with National Geographic related to that. What, what brought it on, Cy? What led to the creation of Secrets of the Octopus? Well, in March of 2011, I met my first octopus, Athena. I went to the New England Aquarium and behind the scenes, Scott Dowd lifted the tank, the, the, um, the lid to her tank. You've got to keep a lid on your tank or the octopus will get out. And this beautiful creature slid from her lair, looked me in the face, and then unfurled herself like a big scarlet silk scarf in the water and began reaching up through the water to essentially investigate me. And I plunged my hands and arms into the water to meet her. And that was what started my obsession with octopus. It resulted in a, a big surprise, international bestseller, The Soul of an Octopus. And, um, and it also inspired Warren to found Octonation. Well, just last year, National Geographic was contemplating making a, a series, three-part series um, called Secrets of the Octopus. And they wanted me to write the companion book. So I jumped on it because this companion book gets to examine some of the new science, of which there is a great deal that has come to the fore since my first octopus book was published in 2015. They are, to me, some of the most, you know, people look at them and they're like, oh, these are aliens. You know, they are some of the most charismatic organisms on, on the entire planet, as far as I'm concerned. They really are just kind of, I like the description that you use, like a, like a scarf. Um, cause they are just this graceful, but powerful, so different and so unique. I mean, what, what was maybe the thing, you know, meeting this octopus, what was like the thing that kind of sparked you into the interest? 
it was this simultaneous sameness and difference. I mean, the difference was obvious. Here is a creature who doesn't even go like head, uh, thorax, limbs. The thing that people think is the octopus's head isn't even their head. It's it's their mantle. And then their head is below that and their arms are attached to their head and their mouth is in their armpits. They have no bones. They breathe water. They change color and shape. They can shoot ink. They have venom. They have a beak like a parrot, three hearts, blue blood, so different from us. We last shared a common ancestor half a billion years ago when everyone was a tube. And yet, when I met Athena, when this beautiful, huge creature comes flowing out of her lair to greet me, it was extremely evident that she was just as curious about me as I was about her. And I felt there could be a meeting of the minds. As anyone listening, and as anyone who's familiar with your work, um, it's not a surprise. I mean, you have a powerful way with words uh, in your descriptions of things. And Soul of an Octopus, like you said, was was an incredible success. What is um, perhaps different or contrasting? You know, what what's the uh, shift in direction, perhaps, with Secrets of the Octopus? Is Secrets of the Octopus is about all this brand new science. The Soul of an Octopus was more of my personal journey. It was an exploration into the nature of consciousness in us and in animals. But Secrets of the Octopus is very science focused. It's bookended by my own story, but it really highlights a lot of the answers that are coming out to questions that I wondered about while I was researching soul of an octopus. The amount of science that has come out since 2015 is staggering. And Warren and I are feeling like we are right now in the golden age of octopus research and octopus appreciation. When I was working on the first book, if you could find a mug with an octopus on it, you had really scored. And if there was a news item with an octopus in it, like, wow, that was really rare. Well, now the news, there's a tsunami of new science coming in. And as far as, as merch and art and appreciation, you could, and there are those of us who have decorated their house from top to bottom, including their bodies with octopus stuff, octopus tattoos and octopus candelabra and octopus towels and octopus bathroom fixtures and oct. I mean, you can just go octo <laughs> and it's a right good thing to be doing. And Warren, so is that, that's, you started Octonation as, as a response to uh, Soul of the Octopus? Yeah, so I became fascinated with octopuses when I was seven years old, and I went on a field trip to the aquarium and saw one for the first time. And I was diagnosed with autism very young and ADHD. And um, so for the latter or the younger person in my life, I was kind of like nonverbal. I would just keep to myself and was really interested in just taking in all sorts of information. And this was a creature that I couldn't find any information about. Even as like a very curious seven-year-old, I remember being like going straight to the library and asking the librarian, yes, I'd like to see a book on octopus. And, you know, she was like, well, we have an encyclopedia and it would be a very kind of like a, you know, this is where it lives. This is like very field guide ish. And I was like, okay, but I want to know more. I want to know how does this even work? And how does this, they're not talking about any of the things that I want to know about. Then I went to the bigger library and there were some, you know, some books, but I didn't really understand what the words meant or, and I just remember being very curious and being like, there's still so much that we have yet to like uncover about this, this creature. And, you know, being a kid and obsessed with lots of different things, aliens being one of them, I remember just thinking people don't know about them because, you know, they're aliens and they have so much ancient intelligence. And I kind of, when people would ask me, what's your favorite animal? I would say the octopus, but I didn't really know too much about them other than, you know, just a little bit. And it wasn't until 2015 when Sai in the first three or four pages of her book say, 
the octopus has been a, a figure in history that's been constantly misrepresented, been and put in political cartoons, been made to be uh, an animal that's devious, that's malicious, that's slimy, that's alien. That's and I was like, mm-hmm. wow. And I was just like, I at the time I was working in um, New York and I was doing a lot of PR and marketing, and I thought they just need a better PR agent and thought I could do that. I want to be the PR agent for the octopus. And that's when I started Octonation. And I remember um, before I started it, I was looking for validation from everywhere to not do it. And um, I told my brother, I think I'm going to do this octopus fan club. And he was just like, you work with celebrities and models and you got all these really cool parties. Um, He goes, are octopuses even extinct? Like, do people even care about them? And I was just like, why, why do we only care about animals that are at the brink of extinction? Like, why, you know, and I just remember this, it kind of gave me permission to say, no, we need to rethink the way that we think about our oceans. And I thought I could do that. I thought I could accomplish that. And a successful job. Yeah, I feel you do. I mean, I mean, Instagram, I just had to pull up to double check. I mean, cause I thought the number was right. And it is 408,000 followers on, on Instagram alone. And that's not the only platform by any means or yeah. the only, you know, only place to see the people who uh, who follow along and also share that interest. Yeah, we've grown um, to over a million across all of our platforms. And then this past year alone, we've reached over half a billion people with our educational, kind of like our journalistic shorts of different species. And just, you know, just taking um, a piece of information and just really expanding on it so that people can really understand just how cool these creatures are and um, just rethinking the way that we think about them. And I heard earlier in the podcast, it's so fun to kind of say, and I think it's so fun to kind of explore how different they are. But I think what I um, read in Sai's book in 2015 was what really stuck out to me was how similar we are um, and, and how do we look at certain things um, and explore how different but how how much similar we are and so like one of the things is like they're suckers um they have this you know chitinous cuticle um that protects their their suckers and when they want to improve their taste on objects or they want to uh improve their grip on objects they kind of swirl them around like they're on self-cleaning mode and they just like swirl them around and then they like kind of like you know shed off that sucker lining And so I, you know, in one of my posts, I explored the idea that maybe they're giving themselves manicures and maybe they're taking themselves for a spa day. And I introduced it in a way that was so similar to us. And that post went viral. And people were like, I had no idea octopuses gave themselves manicures. And it gave people permission to talk about this creature in a way that they had never spoken about them before. And I feel like that's what it takes nowadays um, is really, you know, trying to think of new creative ways in order to get people to talk about our oceans. Um, because they are entertaining, <laughs> you know, they are, you know, with TikTok and all these other social media platforms, you know, uh, vying for everybody's attention, we just have to work smarter and and really prove that there are other lives and other creatures um, that are worthy of our, our respect, attention and admiration. You know, you both are so correct on that. And, uh, you know, when I was younger, I used to get these mailers each week, uh, these like species profile things that I would put in a binder. And, and you're talking about, you know, the information about like octopus uh, was wanting for sure. And just recently I was looking at one of them. I was looking at the, the insert for the giant Pacific octopus and it was very field guidey, very limited, but you turn to the next page and there's this in-depth information and about their personalities and behaviors and so correct. What I love, uh, and both of you are doing this in, in kind of in tangent and in different ways, is you are incorporating storytelling into conservation, which is such an absolutely powerful tool because so much of the history of conservation has all been fact sheets and field guides, you know, as far as uh, how the information about the animals are are communicated. And so, yes, with Octonation, I mean, the the approaches of, you know, kind of comparing to the human experience and showcasing those similarities. Um, one thing I think is just very powerful is doing that with an animal that is so on the outside, different looking from us. Uh, if people can kind of accept that message and they, and they can see themselves in something that's so different looking, that extends even, you know, closer into organisms that are more similar looking and other types of organisms that are very different looking. 
what you both have mentioned at this point is looking at an octopus looking so different and yet seeing something uh, in tangent in spirit and the way that they act. So I guess that's my question is intelligence, consciousness, awareness, personality. I mean, what are some ways that you have seen that uh, within octopus? Well, at Seattle Aquarium, you can often tell a lot about the individual octopus's personality by their name. There was one who lived there. They named her Emily Dickinson because she was so shy she never came out from behind the filter. They had to let her go because no one ever saw her. But contrast that with the one that they named Leisure Suit Larry. And he was so friendly that he would put one arm on you and you'd peel that away. And then two of his arms would be on you to peel those away. And then three arms would be on you and you'd peel those away. He didn't want to let go. And the octopuses that I knew personally were quite distinctive in personality. And some people could say like, oh gosh, you know, aren't you just projecting this onto an animal? But scientists are now uh, really carefully studying personality and how it affects an individual's life. Because, for example, if you are a bold octopus, it is worth noting whether you are more likely to be eaten by a predator or whether you are more likely to have a larger territory or whether you're more likely to eat a larger variety of foods. And there's people studying that. In fact, I was part of a team in Morea that we, we did a, a small study on that. Um, their intelligence, there's an entire section in the book, which is in three parts. The second section is called Gelatinous Geniuses, which in fact looks at their intelligence. And their intelligence, you know, intelligence is one of those things we measure it all different ways. And um, even in humans, we're starting to, to understand there is more than one kind of intelligence. It's not just SATs. There's also emotional intelligence, etc. cetera. Um, but one of the characteristics that we recognize in intelligent animals is problem solving. And um, octopuses solve problems all the time. For them, it's a problem that they're in a tank sometimes and they want to get out and they want to explore and they will find their way out of there. They love to work puzzles. They love to play with the same toys that our children do. They love Legos. They love Mr. Potato Head. They have invented games. Um, at Seattle Aquarium, They, uh, Roland Anderson and Jennifer Mather authored a paper about an octopus that was basically using a floating pill bottle, which was part of another experiment, as a ball. And he kept using his jet, the siphon with which it jets through the water. It can also use it like a leaf blower. And it can shoot water out of its jet. And this is what it was doing. It was shooting the water out of its jet at the floating pill bottle in a way that it would go into the circulating water and essentially bounce the ball back into his arms. And this was observed in several different individuals. So they invent games. They also use tools. And I was alive. I'm 66 years old and I was alive during a time that it was believed that tool use separated humans and our intelligence from the whole rest of the world, that man was the tool using organism. Well, now we know that all kinds of animals, including insects and fish, will use tools. But octopuses, you'll actually see on the uh, National Geographic uh, TV show, the, the, um, the second part, Adam Geiger managed to get footage of an octopus who was being bothered by a shrimp. And you think like, how can a shrimp bother you? But there are some shrimp with like pointy body parts they can poke you with and you don't like that. So this, this shrimp was annoying the octopus and the octopus looked around and he saw a shell and he picked it up and used it as a shield. And this is, this is right on. There's also octopuses, coconut octopuses, that will pick up two halves of a coconut, lug them um, in two arms in their mantle, use two other arms, almost like feet, to walk along 
like, you know, someone leaving the, the, uh, the baggage claim at the airport. And he'll be carrying these two halves of a coconut a long distance. And why? Because he wants to put them together and get inside like a, like a Quonset hunt. There's, there's a quote that I've, that I've heard many, many times, and I don't know who the originator of it is. Um, something about, you know, humans are not quite intelligent enough to really know how intelligent other organisms are. Yeah, um, that's actually the, the title mm-hmm. of a book. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, we don't know. And an octopus could well ask a human, well, how many colors can your severed arm turn in four-fifths of a second? And conclude that we're idiots because our severed arm will not turn any colors ever, even if it's not severed. But they can do that. I hate to reduce such complicated creatures into like a what is your favorite type of question. But in terms of favorites, if you had to pick any particular species, um, what would be for both of you, what would be a favorite? I feel like, yeah, I feel like for me, um, because I would say that like, I'm an expert as it relates to the species of octopuses. Every single time I take an exploration, just like Sai took an exploration into giant Pacific octopuses and Solvan octopus, I fall in love with, um, the life of a certain species. And that's how I wrote about them in secrets of the octopus at the end, there's 16 octo profiles and we, we sneak in two cuttlefish and, uh, and so every single time I'm writing about them, I it's like meditative for me. I fall in love. It's like I, I feel like every single time I write on Octonation, it's a love letter to my community um, introducing, you know, this species. And so but to answer your question, the one that I I was most happy that I got to work into the book was the hairy octopus, um, because they're the size of your fingernail and they've yet to be scientifically described. We don't really know what they eat. We don't know how long they live. But we do know that they look like a pom pom ball. You know, they grow this papillae, which is like these, they look like underwater Fabios with their hair, um, just kind of like looking like algae. And um, what's really interesting about how they get around is they will just kind of like jump up. Yeah, there it is. We just, they just jump up into the water column and let the ocean currents kind of just take them um, for a ride somewhere, almost like a ride share, like an ocean current ride share. And um, they're just a really interesting, really interesting species that I feel like no, not that many people talk about. If you Google it, hairy octopus, octonation comes up as number one. And there's so many species that I know about because I'm connected with researchers all over the world that want their octopus to be a front runner. You know, like just like the, uh, the TV series has a cast of different octopuses. Um, they want their species to, to get the limelight. And it's so cool that with Octonation, we can, we can do that. You know, we can reach um, millions of people through our videos. And we just did recently. They hadn't seen the species in over 15 years. They had no video footage of it. It was a, 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 a frilled pygmy octopus out in Australia, New Zealand. And nobody had ever seen that species move. And uh, we got to showcase it on Octonation and spread it all over the world. And typically what happens is that underwater photographer or videographer is reached out to to license the content so they can make money. And a whole chain of events happens um, that can change the life of that underwater photographer and put them on the map, um, which has just been really fun that we could have created that platform to, to make people know that if you're an art you know, art artist who loves doing octopus. We have a community for you. If you're, no matter what you're into, it's like, we've, we've got the community that wants to support you. Well, my favorite, I have to say, has to be the giant Pacific because my friends who I knew best were giant Pacific octopuses. It's the the species that most people get to meet in aquarium. Um, They, in the wild, they've been known to grow as big as 300 pounds. But even a small one, um, like Athena, she only weighed 40 pounds, but she was magnificent. And when she unfurled her arms, each arm was about four feet long. But she just filled, she not just seemed to fill the tank, she seemed to fill up all of my senses. Sorry, John Denver, but uh, <laughs> she she seemed impossibly gorgeous, impossibly gifted, impossibly huge. And 
I felt so humbled and honored that she would bother with me. So I love the re- like referring as as friend um, because it reminded me, and I, I had to pull it up just to double check, but it's the uh, the Cousteau, uh quote. It's the uh, we only protect what we love, we only love what we understand, and we only understand what we're taught. And so, of course, the goal it seems of the book. The series Octo Nation is all about teaching, understanding, getting people to love them so that they can be protected, so they can be appreciated into the future. And I will wonder if for a moment you could talk about conservation wise, like what what is the reality right now? Uh, what efforts are in place? I can speak to the surprising thing that I discovered by maintaining my position on inspiring wonder of the ocean by educating the world about octopuses. Because for a long time in the beginning of my community, my community wanted to be so many different things. They wanted to be activists. They wanted to be animal rights people. They wanted to be, you know, conservationists. They wanted to go all over the map. And I kind of had to make a decision on staying true to what this purpose of this organization was going to be. And I really was like, there's so many nonprofits that deal with animal rights issues. There's so many. But for me, I really wanted to stay in the lane of of ocean literacy and inspiring that wonder so that people could anchor themselves to their affinity to the ocean and something that was real and that mattered to them and not a decision that they were being told to make by somebody who was just like, this is wrong or this is right. And they had no context as to why they should care. And um, so for me, what's been really surprising is I have parents that tell me, I watch Octonation every night with my child and it's, I just thought you should know that we were at, you know, some fast food restaurant and they said, where do I throw this out so that it doesn't hurt the octopus? And that's a decision that they made, not because they were told to or that she, she was like, whatever. It's a conscious decision that she felt empowered to say to their, her parents to because she was rooted in something that she cared about. And I feel like that is the way that that would have been great for me to learn. Unfortunately, when I was growing up, it was all. Sarah McLaughlin in the arms of an angel with dogs in cages. And that was the way that, you know, animal rights and, and causes were. But I think in the age of the internet, um, we can have nuanced conversations now. We're not bound by 30 second media clips. You know, some of the, the best podcasts in the world are three, four, five hours long uh, and they're nuanced takes at things. And I feel like people are starving for, they're deprived of information that they, they um, really want to learn about. And I feel like we have such an opportunity with Octonation to have them read that. I remember people would tell me all the time, no one's going to read long captions on Instagram. Short form content is the way to go, all of this kind of stuff. And yet I max out my captions every single time with, with 2,200 characters. I know the max limit. And people read you know, these captions. They, they want more. They're like, where can I get? Is there another blog on this? Like they want to know more. And so I can only really speak to... Um, my reality, which is by saying true and educating and inspiring that wonder, people can make their own decisions that's rooted in that literacy and they can go off and they can sort of champion the causes they want to by something real. Um, so I might have the answer for the other half. Well, I, I would share with you an example of a girl I met when she was nine. I gave a talk about octopus at her school. And Warren's going to meet her for the first time in person on Wednesday uh, because we're doing a talk at Mystic Aquarium. And her name is Heidi. And she walked up to me after I'd spoken to her class and she says, "Ah, I love octopus. What can I do to help octopus? And I I said, well, um, we don't know of any uh, charity that protects octopus per se, and we don't actually know of any species that are endangered. But if you help the sea, you're going to help the octopus. Well, this nine-year-old went home and made these beautiful cloth bags that people could use to cart their groceries home in instead of the plastic bags that all end up in the ocean, and sold them and made jewelry with sea themes. And she made thousands of dollars, which she then donated to New England Aquarium. This was a nine-year-old girl, just one kid's effort. And I think that octopuses can be such great ambassadors to remind us that the sea is our mother. 
you know, and um, whatever talent you have, if your talent is, is artwork, you're serving octopuses in the sea by sharing the, the beauty of your, your canvas. Um, if you uh, are a, a writer, you can write stories, nonfiction and fiction. There's a huge best-selling work fiction out there right now that sold way more than anything I'll ever write called Remarkably Bright Creatures. Um, we, we could help the sea in so many ways uh, with, with our, our, what we choose to eat, how we choose to vote, by writing letters, by doing a beach cleanup, by so many things. And Warren is so right. Pick the thing that's your passion Pick the thing that is fun. Pick the thing that feeds your spirit. And in that way, help and glorify what you love. You know, in in the book itself, from what I've seen so far, I mean, it's it's gorgeous. It's beautifully put together. I think you're both doing a fantastic job of doing exactly what you're saying. It's kind of, you know, play into your talents and your passions to to support the things that you love. series as well you know the snippets that i've seen thus far i mean the footage is just extraordinary what are you i mean is it is it just the to, to inspire that the love and the passion of the people who are who are reading and and watching i mean what are your biggest hopes and dreams uh when it comes to you know this book the series the impacts well for me it is to inspire awe and and reverence and not just for the octopus itself. I mean, here's this creature so different from us. And look at us in our human world and how much trouble we're, we seem to be having caring about people who aren't exactly like us, you know? That this, this person speaks a different language. Oh my gosh, and that person has a different religion. Oh, that's dreadful, you know? Um, if you can be friends with an octopus, I hope we can love each other better and love each other, not just for our sameness, but for our differences as well. I think for me, you know, I always would say that people that have the ability to appreciate something um, outside of themselves and kind of detach themselves from the ego for a second, you know, to consider the fact that there are creatures on this in this, on this planet that have been here for hundreds of millions of years, um, they represent resiliency. They repre- represent adaptability, intelligence, all these values. Um, and if they can just consider something outside of themselves more than maybe that can be enough for them to, to work on, on, on solving problems or to work on, um, just taking a break from, from being, I don't want to say self-centered or being just so self-consumed or egotistical or whatever. It's just like, there have, there are creatures that have figured it out. Um, and so when I, when I look at the octopus and I just look at what they represent, it's just, you know, consider the octopus. Um, and you know, when we look at an octopus, like going back to what my brother said about, I think you should focus on an animal that's not, that's, that's going extinct. So people actually care. It's, you know, trying to get this, this whole paradigm shift where it's just like um, understanding that there are creatures like the octopus that are in every single food web, um, you know, on the planet and yet they're thriving. Um, They, when you think about animals and what Sai said to that young girl, you know, none of them are endangered. Is that, does that mean we shouldn't care? Or does that mean we should be more curious? Um, You know, and and I take the stance of let's really consider this, you know, let's um, look into what we can learn from them. And we see that in AI and in in robotics and everything that they're creating and kind of being inspired about the octopus. Um, There's so much. um, And I, I hope my dream for the book is that when people are introduced to different species uh, and introduced to their kind of their lives, um, you know, uh, I talk about like the blanket octopus uh, that spends our whole entire life floating through the open ocean. And um, when it's time to lay eggs, she grows these biological stalks made of calcium carbonate out of her body naturally, um, like Jack and the Beanstalk style. <laughs> and just, they just sprout out. And um, that's what she uses to attach her, her eggs to. She never touches the ocean floor. She, like her lifespan is in the, the middle of the water column. 
And it's just considering like that, wow, she's really got it figured out. And she's she's been doing this for hundreds of millions of years. And I think that's just inspirational to me to to work towards, you know, hey, how is we can humans, can we figure our stuff out? Like, you know, because can we do that through communication? Can we do that through however means necessary? Because, you know, here's a creature that's, I don't know, it's just, it's inspirational for me to use it as a, as a way to be inspired more and to think of the wonder of life. And, and yeah, so that's, that's my hope for the book. You both uh, are, are so good um, at sharing your passion and your love for these creatures. And it just, uh, it's truly inspiring and hearing your responses on these things is just, uh, uh, it fires me up to, to want to do more myself. And I really, I just have two Two uh, questions. The one being, I out of my own curiosity, just putting together this book. I know it was a years, you know, long process. What what's your most memorable experience from that process? I'll tell you mine. The best thing I did was insist that Warren write the Octo profiles and that we get um, Octo Nation on board. This was the funnest, best thing. Getting to work, getting to work with Warren. We we had met in 2015, and uh, it was it was one of those things that the minute we saw each other and started nerding out, we kind of felt like I don't know brothers and sisters under the skin. <laughs> so that that was the high point for me having both of our names together in a book for National Geographic. I'm really proud of that. Yeah, I'm, I was actually going to have the same answer from the standpoint of, uh, <laughs> it was almost like, ima- imagine like, you know, in 2015, imagine me in a career that I wasn't happy about. I'm, I'm working in the fashion industry and I'm working with all these companies that I'm like, to what end are we doing any of this for? And I remember reading Sai's words. And as, I mean, you can tell just by listening to her talk about the octopus, I was like, I want to be that lit up about anything, you know, in my life. And it just so happened that she wrote a book about my favorite animal, you know? And so I remember reading her words and and just being like, yeah, this is what it's going to take to inspire people to care. It inspires me. And so if I can just hold a microphone to the passion that she has, um, but in a digital space, because she has no desire <laughs> to be online all the time. She'd rather be, you know, with a turtle or be with an octopus or be with all the other 38 books. You know, she's written about all of these amazing animals. Um, and so I thought, I, yeah, if I could just do that. And so I, I took her same passion, her same fervor, her same, you know, way that she goes about being passionate about something. And I'd like to think, um, that with Octonation and with the work that we we try to do, that we're we're doing it together. That like I'm hold, like I'm I'm making something happen. And um, and I like to see with the comment section, you see a lot of all these other organizations that are funded, that are so heavily funded, millions and millions of dollars uh, for all these other organizations. But if you look at our social media profile, we have hundreds and hundreds of comments beneath all of our posts. And I think there's something to be said about. And there are people that are connected and there are people that are excited and there's people that are learning and there are people that are, and I'm like, there's something to be said about what's happening here. Um, I think this is what it's going to take. And, um, and I hope we're just mapping wonder to the ocean through the eyes of an octopus. And I feel like that's like, again, what it's going to take uh, for people to realize um, that, yeah, life began in the ocean and, it's not going anywhere, you know, so we got to get our stuff together. So, because, you know, if, if you look at our history, it doesn't look so great, but if you look at the octopus's history, they've managed to figure it out through mass extinctive events that have wiped out most of life on this planet. And yet they're still here. They're still trucking. So I just like to consider, you know, uh, consider the octopus. Now, if you're wondering when you can get your hands on secrets of the octopus, well, the answer is, now yeah you can you can yeah you can go uh it's available it's gonna be available wherever books are sold what's really exciting was they just sent us the cover for uh the japanese translation and that cover looks amazing it looks so cool and just the idea that um with that there's already that much demand um for for the book to be translated because normally that comes 
like two or f- I don't know, five months or six months or they see how it's selling. Well, apparently there's already that much of a demand for, for this information that they're already translating it. That's, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. And when, when is the, uh, the special coming to national geographic? Earth day, earth day, April 21st, April 21st. It's, it's coming out on national geographic. And then the next day it'll be available on Disney plus and Hulu. Um, so you can watch it uh, there. And it's so exciting because the, the, the thing that I love the most about this is that we're actually, uh, we know, and a lot of the members in Octonation have worked on this documentary. So it's a, the whole entire team is cephalopod enthused. And so it's really cool. I think this is like the octopus dream team um, from the cinematographer to the host, to me and Cy writing the book, to like, we have really managed to, pull together all these cephalopod resources uh, for both of these projects. So I cannot wait to see. And we, James Cameron like took a break from filming Avatar, one of the most expensive movies of all time to film our underwater avatars that exist right here on this planet. <laughs> that That's have for hundreds of millions of years. Yeah. Wow. So i um, really excited about um, his interpretation because I know it's mm-hmm. going to be phenomenal. Now, if you're all geeked up with anticipation right now, and you just feel like you can't wait for Secrets of the Octopus to come out, well, Warren and Octonation might have some things to satiate your needs. Tons of amazing merch, coloring sheets, stickers. I can send, I can send you some um, coloring sheets. The, another cool thing about Octonation is I've managed to find one of the coolest, you know, um, artists and creative directors on the planet that designed my, you know, designed my logo and has designed all of these stickers that are very species specific. Like you have um, this one I'm showing on the screen is a ruby um, octopus and it's reading our book, Secrets of the Octopus. And um, what I wanted was like, I'm really, I think it's the autism, but I, I was like, there's no anatomically correct characters that are, are, that are teaching about all the biodiversity. So, uh, you know, Chris has, has developed all these different characters like Latte Luna, who is a blue ringed octopus that has a skull and crossbones and is making a latte that's, you know, has tetrodotoxin in it. And, um, and, you know, we have all these different characters like French press Freddy, who's a common octopus and, and they're all anatomically correct. They all got horizontal pupils. They all have got siphons. They've got mantle cavities. And we feel like you can educate while being fun and formative and, um, I'm interested into like developing that into more cartoons. And we have so many cool people that are obsessed with octopuses. If you look at our, um, our list of celebrities that follow Octonation, you've got Pedro Pascal, you've got um, Michael B. Jordan, you've got Busta Rhymes, you've, you've got, you know, so many different cool people that uh, cannot wait for this, um, this TV series that's coming out on Earth Day. And I, I, uh, endlessly excited right there along with them. That's for sure. Uh, Thank you both so much. I mean, this has been a a complete honor. It's, it's been a privilege. Uh, You're both so well-spoken, so clearly passionate. And I just, uh, I'm so happy that there are people like the two of you in this world that are doing this kind of work and doing this kind of communication and getting so many other people fired up. Uh, Because as you've both said, I mean, this is the work and, and this is the way that it needs to be done. And you're, you're nailing it. That's for sure. And you're doing you're doing the same thing with this podcast. So <laughs> right. thank you so much for amplifying. And with your tank. We're yeah. wishing you luck with the setup of your your tank. Oh yeah. We're <laughs> we're close. I just a uh, couple of little added as I Thanks to, again I to the Cy Montgomery and Warren Carlisle for joining me today on The Wildlife. Secrets of the Octopus is available now wherever you like to get your books. And be sure to tune in to Secrets of the Octopus on National Geographic and Disney Plus this Earth Day. For links and information including how to join Octonation, where to follow Cy and Warren on social media, and how to support this show, just check out the episode notes. I hope you enjoyed today's episode, and as always, I'm open to feedback and any questions that you might have. I'd love to answer them on the show. So send them my way at hello at thewildlife.blog, or you can message me on TikTok or Instagram at Devin the Nature Guy. And remember, stay curious, wander often, wander always, and peace out, Rainbow Trouts. <laughs>